Next on Link TV. Latin polls, news and analysis from Latin America as seen by Latin American media, followed by a panel discussion on the issues. Next on Latin polls, only on Link TV. The following program is an original production of Link TV. Public transportation, a way of life in Latin America, where older cars are creating havoc, but so are new transportation systems. And Latin America seems to be at the forefront of alternative fuels and at the center of a new controversy. Estamos entrando a una crisis energética mundial. This and more coming up next on Latin Pulse. Hello and welcome to Pulso Latino. My name is Marcos Gutierrez. Our first topic tonight, Latin America caught between increasing productivity and trade and having to move people to and from work more efficiently as pressure increases for energy conservation and a cleaner environment. El gas natural efectivamente reduce el material particulado, prácticamente no lo produce y por lo tanto eliminamos el problema serio que tenemos actualmente en la, en la zona metropolitana. As demand for labor goes up, so does demand for better public transportation. Las tarifas actuales no soportan este tram Santiago. No le quepa duda, se podrá suceder un tiempo, unos meses, pero en algún minuto, no muy lejano, 380 pesos, 400 pesos no dan para este sistema. Is public transportation the answer or the problem? Nosotros nos dijo que con la nueva transporte nosotros íbamos a estar mucho mejor, íbamos a llegar más temprano a la casa, más tiempo con la familia, cosa que se ha perdido. Nosotros tenemos que ahora madrugar mucho más, eh, sacrificarnos mucho más. Most economies in Latin America are currently transitioning into a new era of growth and global trade. More and more people seem to be participating in this new demand for labor. But most of the region is still commuting to work in 20th century technology. This seems to be a huge issue in bigger cities like Sao Paulo or Mexico City, where cars are clogging highways and choking the environment, as we see in the following report from Mexico's Once Noticias. Son los vehículos que más contaminan en la zona metropolitana del Valle de México. Modelos 1992 y anteriores con sistemas de carburación capaces de generar hasta 15 veces más emisiones que aquellos que cuentan con convertidor catalítico. Porque este tipo de vehículos eh, provocan casi el 50% de la contaminación y de la producción de ozono en la atmósfera del Valle de México. Altas emisiones de hidrocarburos, monóxido de carbono, óxido de nitrógeno y otros gases tóxicos salen del escape de estos autos sin pasar por ningún filtro y van directo al aire. No solo la antigüedad es el problema, también la falta de mantenimiento. Este motor pertenece a un vehículo 1986. Está sucio y sus mangueras y aditamentos lucen viejos. Este otro 1984 ya ni siquiera los tiene. Y ahorita exactamente a este vehículo se le va a dar un rechazo porque no cuenta con estos aditamentos. Rural areas in Latin America are not immune to transportation issues. The problem in some parts of the region seems to be that of control and infrastructure, as we hear in this report from Bolivia's Noticiero Pat. Tras el accidente de la flota El Dorado en la carretera Santa Cruz-Cochabamba, el gobierno está preocupado, pues se puso en evidencia la inseguridad y el control deficiente en las operaciones de buses interdepartamentales. Este lunes, el presidente de la República, ministro de Gobierno de la Presidencia y el alto mando policial se reunieron para intentar encontrar medidas estructurales más allá de las preventivas. Pero no solo el control de la policía, también de varias instituciones que tienen que ver con esto. La superintendencia de transportes que debe verificar las condiciones técnicas en las cuales operan las empresas de transporte. El Ministerio de Trabajo que debe verificar las condiciones laborales en que operan los, eh, que trabajan los, los choferes. Muchos de ellos son asalariados. Hay quienes extienden su jornada de trabajo entre esos choferes. Hay quienes trabajan 24 horas seguidas. Latin America also has success stories to tell when it comes to public transportation. Medellín's subway is one of them, as we hear in this report from Colombia's RCN. 
Muy buenos días. Se trata de la certificación en gestión ambiental bajo la norma ISO 14001, que certifica al metro como la única opción de transporte masivo limpio en Colombia. Esta certificación incluye los vagones, las estaciones, así como el metro cable. Muy satisfactorio, porque con ello, pues hoy que está en boom el calentamiento global y que nos estamos dando cuenta de que es como cierto, que es verdad, pues aportarle un poco a la naturaleza, un poco al medio ambiente por parte del Metro de Medellín, generando más cultura metro, es bastante satisfactorio para todos. Durante 2006, el Metro de Medellín evitó la emisión de 768 toneladas de productos contaminantes, gracias a que su sistema de alimentación es totalmente eléctrico. But the horror story seems to be a new system the Chilean government implemented earlier this year in Santiago. The idea was to improve a system that had worked pretty good for decades. Chile's Canal 13 reports that under the new system, people are stranded for hours waiting for buses to go to and from work, and people are literally fed up. Estamos 20, 30 minutos esperando para poderlos venir. ¿Sabe que estamos hasta aquí? ¿Hasta cuándo los van a tener sufriendo de esa manera? Porque este es un abuso que están haciendo con nosotros. Yo ya no doy más. Paciencia que se agota y el invierno parece ser la nueva preocupación. Los paraderos, si bien están muchos de ellos avanzados e incluso terminados, los techos solo protegen a un mínimo de pasajeros. El resto, si hubiese una lluvia, terminarían bajo el agua. Yo quiero ver qué va a pasar aquí cuando llueva. Esto es un desastre. Siempre hay cola, siempre hay que ser... Esperar una hora, esperando en la micro. Imagínate, va el invierno cuando venga la lluvia. Todo mojado acá, esperando en la micro. Estar una hora, dos horas aquí es mucho. Nos congelamos, imagínese para el invierno. No, no puede ser esto, tiene que cambiar. Cambios que tras varios anuncios de las autoridades parecen, en este caso, no tener efecto. El ajuste del Transantiago se podría prolongar incluso por seis meses más. Por lo que pensar en el término de las largas filas a corto plazo... Parece ser una utopía. With us tonight in our studio to explore this issue is Jennifer Krill, Program Director at Rainforest Action Network, Paulo Sotero, Director of the Brazilian Institute at the Woodrow Wilson Center, joins us from Washington, D.C. Ms. Krill, we have our own public transportation issues in this country. Why should we care if people in Latin America take two or three hours to get to work? I think the transportation becomes a bit of a quality of life issue. And in the United States, where we consume a quarter of the world's oil, I think that we should care a great deal also about the equity issue of being able to um, make sure that everybody has free and fair access to public transportation, make sure everybody has free and fair access to the same sorts of quality of life that we have in the U.S. Obviously, there is a matter of equity because the poor people live two to three hours from downtown to, to their work, uh, from, uh, from where they, 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 they have to uh, get uh, into public transportation that normally is not uh, of very good quality. And uh, this is just plain unfair. This is costly. It produces a lot of air pollution, uh, less and less as we move to natural gas. But there is really a matter of e efficiency in the economy and quality uh, uh, of life. as it was just mentioned so while the people you know the beautiful people the people that have money live uh, in the better areas in the downtown areas there is obviously a need to combine all those those solutions in the city of sao paulo is a clear demonstration that we need to tackle seriously mm -hmm. those issues now i wanted to ask uh, uh, about the functioning of a country with only public transportation can a country function with only public transportation do you think I think personal transportation is important, but one thing that we need to consider when we think about what the future direction of transportation worldwide is, do we want everybody to replicate the U.S. model? And it is true that Latin American cities use more pu public transportation than U.S. cities. U.S. cities, by and large, have very difficult or poor, hard to access public transportation, and that's an equity I issue in U.S. cities very much so. Um, you know, we, uh, if over 70 percent of the population in the world is living in cities, then public transportation is, is going to be key to, to moving these people around. Private transportation and personal transportation is important, but we don't have to replicate the same model that we have in the U.S. with the inefficient internal combustion engine and the big SUVs driving everybody around. 
What we're advocating for in the U.S. and what we would advocate for worldwide is to bypass that liquid fuel transportation. Instead, let's have people have electric cars that they plug in, it's cleaner, it's more efficient, and we don't have the problem of oil addiction. So do you feel that uh, here in the United States we have to change our culture to accept the public over uh, private transportation? We absolutely do. I mean, uh, the U.S., as I said earlier, consumes a quarter of the oil in the world. And if you look at what's happening in the Middle East, we don't have any worries in the world about going to war over oil. Oil. In fact, most of our oil imports are from conflict regions. It's very, very important for the U.S. to deal with this dependence on oil in a way that is proactive and that helps us be energy independent and that also um, enables us to keep a strong economy because, you, you know, a strong economy is important for everybody in the U.S. and, and everywhere else. So I'd like to ask uh, El Señor Paulo Sotero, what can we learn from uh, transportation uh, in Latin America here in the United States? Well, you know, uh, the only thing probably that we can teach is in the, the types of fuel we are using in Brazil, it is uh, within uh, certain limits. Uh, we have a very good positive experience on the ethanol case, but let's not overdo it. Uh, ethanol can be part of a uh, solution. Uh, you have to diversify the types of fuels you need. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, nothing will replace a good rational conservation policy, and this starts with a huge tax on gasoline. This is what will make all alternative fuels uh, economically viable, and I'm talking about wind power, I'm talking about electric cars. There will not be, there will not be one solution, uh, but uh, it all, those all good solutions will depend on a very good conservation policy on people, uh, you know, uh, uh, finally recognizing that we have to change the patterns uh, of uh, energy consumption, and obviously uh, the United States has to lead the way in that regard. How do you feel about that particular issue, uh, what we can learn from uh, Latin America here in the United States as far as transportation? I absolutely, absolutely agree with Paolo. It, you know, Brazil does set a very good example for energy independence, and they set it using ethanol. What the U.S. should not learn is that we can also let, grow our way out of our oil addiction. I think that there's a larger problem in the United States that, that Paolo pointed to that's exactly true that's about conservation. First of all, we drive too much in the U.S., we drive too big of cars in the U.S., the automakers produce too big of cars in the U.S., and the government doesn't regulate it. A, a, a tax on gasoline or a tax on carbon is one of the first ways that we would go about it. And I would say a, ca a tax on carbon is better than a gas tax because then we make sure that if we have electric cars, we're plugging into a green grid, we're plugging into rooftop solar and, and not plugging into dirty coal-fired power plants. So the, the best thing that we could do is tax all of carbon emissions in the U.S. and that would get people to be less dependent on oil and get us to be less dependent on fossil fuels. And it would also, it would strengthen the U.S. economy, but it would also strengthen economies around the world because we wouldn't have countries around the world wanting to replicate the gas guzzling U.S. culture. Thank you all for uh, your input on this particular issue. Now, please uh, don't go away because uh, when we come back, we'll explore alternative fuels and why this seems to be an issue for some developing countries. Nosotros en, estamos entrando a una crisis energética mundial que ya ha originado al menos una guerra, dos guerras, dos guerras, la de Afganistán y sobre todo ahora la de Irak. Ha originado en nuestro continente al menos hasta ahora un golpe de Estado aquí en Venezuela. La causa se llama petróleo, la causa se llama energía. It is no secret that traditional sources of fuel are drying out and the world seems to be desperately looking for new and cheaper sources of oil. But we recently reported here on Latin Pulse about a cooperation agreement signed by President Bush and Presidente Lula da Silva of Brazil to develop new alternative fuels. Brazil is a world leader in biofuels and as we hear in the following report from Latino America TV, Brazil is not giving in to pressure from oil producing countries. 
engloba un conjunto de medidas. Según Lula, pueden decir lo que quieran, pero el mundo se curvará ante los combustibles renovables y cuando eso suceda, nadie podrá competir con Brasil, que tiene 30 años de experiencia en el desarrollo de etanol y otros carburantes alternativos al petróleo. El presidente brasileño también volvió a responder a quienes sostienen que el desarrollo de los biocombustibles es una amenaza a la producción de alimentos, como los presidentes de Cuba, Fidel Castro y de Venezuela, Hugo Chávez. Por el contrario, Lula insistió en que los biocombustibles serán una herramienta para combatir el hambre y la miseria como fuente de desarrollo de empleo y de riqueza en sectores campesinos actualmente marginados. Brasil es hoy por hoy uno de los grandes productores mundiales de etanol. Este año el gobierno de Lula ha firmado acuerdos bilaterales para la difusión y promoción de este y otros biocombustibles. Venezuela's Hugo Chavez and Cuba's Fidel Castro both say that development of biofuels will literally steal food from the table of the poor to fuel the vehicles of the rich. Chavez, of course, has a vested interest in oil as Venezuela is a leading producer of oil. Argentina's Tele Siete reports that recently Chavez hosted a Latin American energy summit where the main topic was the creation of an energy pool to counter higher demand in the West. Con la importante presencia de 12 mandatarios, el Congreso busca unificar criterios en cuanto a conectividad en materia de gas y electricidad, explorar en el aprovechamiento de energías alternativas y darle continuidad a emprendimientos de la envergadura del gasoducto del sur. Una cumbre muy ambiciosa por lo, lo que está planteado en cuanto a integración económica, integración energética, lo que significa el desafío hacia otras regiones, ¿no? No nos olvidemos que eh, lo que está planteando esta cumbre es que cada país se integre y ponga su energía a disposición del resto de la región y esto, eh, aunque no se diga, es darle la espalda a otros países que pretenden la energía de esta región para, para sí mismo. Estoy hablando de Estados Unidos fundamentalmente, pero también podríamos hablar de Europa y otros países que se abastecen de materias primas, incluida la energía eh, de América Latina. ¿no? Many experts see ethanol and biofuels as a cheaper, cleaner and renewable source of energy. The Mexican Congress recently passed a bill approving the development and use of ethanol and other alternative fuels. Mexico's Once Noticias reports that some also see biofuels as a huge source of employment for Latin America. El uso de biocombustibles en América Latina está destinado a cambiar la región. Los biocombustibles van a representar un cambio de la geoeconomía agrícola mundial, porque los países que tienen tierra, sol, agua, plantas, son capaces de producir su propia energía renovable, ambientalmente más correcta. Algunos expertos señalan que contra lo que comúnmente se piensa, el desarrollo del etanol no implica un desabasto alimenticio, sino que constituye mejores condiciones de vida para la población rural. El crecimiento de esta industria crea fuentes de trabajo para, para toda la región, particularmente con la inversión que se está haciendo en la investigación de bajar los costos y, y crear más innovaciones. Este es algo que se puede crear miles de trabajos. Hay, hay millones de personas saliendo de sus países porque no tienen trabajo. Mr. Sotero, are we really going to take uh, food away from the poor if we develop uh, ethanol as a stronger source of energy? Well, if you look at the example of Brazil, Certainly not. Brazil is the second largest producer of food in the world, and right now, 43% of all fuel used in, li uh, in light uh, vehicles in Brazil is ethanol. So we use only 5% of all the land in use for agriculture in Brazil to produce uh, ethanol. We can expand this, but we can use degraded land, pasture land. Uh, we have uh, that capacity. What you should not do, probably, is to subsidize what happens in the United States, uh, to subsidize one certain products, particularly corn, uh, and then uh, to produce ethanol from that, because that is not very efficient. What you should not do is to tell African countries to produce uh, ethanol from cassava because obviously that's an important source of, of food. 
Yeah, you know, it, Paolo is right. From a, a global energy and climate change perspective, we would be jumping out of the frying pan into the fire if we start deforesting the Amazon or defore, deforesting uh, any forest areas or natural areas in order to grow food crops. You know, we're talking about the biggest, most important carbon sinks in the world. In the U.S., part of what's driving the the the, the need for more biofuels is a need to address climate change. At the state and the city level, over and over again, we see people citing climate change as one of the reasons why they're talking about switching to biofuels. Now, we don't think that's actually the right way to go about it. And if you look at the idea of converting the Amazon rainforest into soy plantations or rainforests in Southeast Asia into palm oil plantations for biodiesel, then, then we would have a, a big, big problem with regard to climate change. Now, let me ask you a question that I asked earlier. Is it a coincidence that the major oil producer in Latin America, Venezuela, is leading the charge against the biofuels? Uh, I don't know if I would call it a coincidence. It's, it's definitely an interesting dynamic. Mm. You know, the, if, 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 for example, Brazil were to want to become an, an ethanol importer into the U.S., if the U.S. were to loosen trade restrictions and make it possible for Brazil to ship biofuels to the U.S., um, then I think that could theoretically work against a major oil exporting company like a country like Venezuela. You know, on the other hand, I, I think that the situation is very dynamic right now. And, and although the U.S., there's a lot of talk about ethanol in the U.S., but the fact is that it's, it's a tiny, tiny fraction of U.S. oil consumption. So I would, I would consider that to be a threat that's pretty far out on the horizon. Uh, Mr. Sotero, is this a philo philosophical or is it a political battle for Mr. Uh, Hugo Chavez? Yeah, you know, I, I, I don't, I would not dare to imagine what goes in Hugo Chavez's mind. <laughs> it, it's really because it changes a lot from one day to the other. So I, uh, I imagine uh, that uh, what uh, made him start this is the fact that President Lula uh, who has uh, very good relationships, uh, you know, uh, with President Bush, and recognize that the national interest of Brazil is into having convergent. Uh, uh, relationships because our national interests are convergent with the interests of the United States regardless of who occupies the White House or the Palacio do Planalto in Brasilia and uh, so uh, President Lula being a very practical uh, politician a very successful one has established this partnership on the search for uh, intelligent ways of expanding production of ethanol in a way that is it's very important that is not harmful for the environment one thing that is very clear in Brazil more and more clear if we do not protect the Amazon not only protect if we don't reforest the areas that have been deforested the rain patterns in Brazil will change Brazil will become a drier country. If that happens, the very productivity of our very successful agriculture will diminish. Therefore, it is in the interest of, is in the national interest of Brazil to protect the Amazon, to reforest the Amazon, and to find the ways to produce biofuels from sugarcane, particularly, uh, in a way that does not put that ecosystem and the other ecosystems that we have, such as the Pantanal, in that we can do it, we prove that we can do it. Yes, there are questions. Palm oil, uh, which is uh, the best plant probably for biodiesel, is a problem because we know that uh, in Southeast, in, in Asia, uh, you could, you, you already have examples of deforestation. So okay. those are complicated questions, but ethanol is not the answer. Ethanol is part of an answer, and again, and the answer is conservation. And how do you feel about that uh, here in the studio, uh, Jennifer Krill? Do you agree with those that ascertain that uh, biofuels is the answer to both the oil shortage and perhaps unemployment? It has been said before, you can't, we, we can't grow our way out of our oil addiction. Um, it, ethanol is part of the answer, that's true. Um, but, you know, I, I agree with Paolo that we can't afford to have the Amazon become a sacrifice zone because it happens to have rich soil that enables us to grow biofuel crops on it. That, that would be, that would just simply be ridiculous. And it would be a, a tremendous loss not only to Brazil, it would be a tremendous loss to the world. We think that ethanol could be part of the solution or biofuels could be part of the solution. But there need to be some key criteria for sustainability. First, food sovereignty is a priority. It's the most important priority when we're talking about crops and changing crops over to fuel. Um, second, we can't be clearing native forests or natural areas to grow new crops. 
Um, we need to hold on to the ecosystems that we've got now. And third, there needs to be a net energy gain. There's no point, in the, in the case of corn ethanol in the U.S. right now, in some cases we put in more energy in terms of fertilizer and in terms of the, growing the cropland than we get out of the fuel itself. There's no point in, in having fuel that actually doesn't have a net energy gain. Thank you very much. And until, obviously, we find a better, cheaper, and cleaner source of energy, this issue will not go away. When we come back, a theater in the streets and 10 feet up in the air, we'll take a look at this art form in a moment. Delegates from across Colombia converged recently in Hula to celebrate the performing arts theater to be more specific. But check this out. It wasn't theater as we know it. It was theater on a higher ground. Acrobacia, danza teatro, espectáculos con fuego e historias contadas a tres metros de altura reunieron a miles de espectadores en el segundo Festival Nacional de Teatro en Sancos que se realizó en varias poblaciones del Huila. El principal objetivo del evento es hacer hermandad, encontrar a los, art los artistas felices, todo Colombia aquí en el Huila. Las 16 compañías, venidas de Nariño, Bogotá, Cali y otras ciudades, llenaron parques y plazas, con la magia de la palabra, el sonido y el movimiento. En Pasto hay mucho trabajo en nivel teatral y la idea es ya sacar todo ese trabajo para afuera, que salgan los escenarios nacionales. Es un, un elemento muy hermoso que podemos eh, compartir, que en el que se puede compartir y se puede vivir y se puede gozar. El festival finalizó en San Agustín Huila con un desfile en homenaje a la Madre Tierra. Pretty neat, don't you think? This is all the time that we have. I trust you enjoyed today's program. I would like to thank our guest here in San Francisco, Jennifer Krill, Program Director at Rainforest Action Network, and in Washington, Paulo Sotero, Director of the Brazil Institute at the Woodrow Wilson Center. I would also like to thank you at home or on the web for being with us today. We would also like to thank American University in Washington, D.C., and the students at the Latin American Media Studies Department who are helping with the research for this particular program. And join us next time when we take a a closer look at Latin America through the eyes of Latin America media. For more information about Fulso Latino and Latin America, log on to linktv.org. My name is Marcos Gutierrez. Thank you very much for watching. We'll see you next time here on Latin Pulse. Latin Polls was made possible thanks to the generous contribution from the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation. Pulso Latino ha sido posible gracias a la generosa contribución de la Fundación John D. y Catherine T. MacArthur. This program is brought to you by Link TV for educational and non-commercial use only. Link TV is the only U.S. network dedicated to global and national news, uncompromising documentaries, and diverse cultural programs. Programs that connect you to the world.